From New York to our Bloomberg television and radio audiences worldwide, this is Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. I want to start out with the markets today, which are sort of all over the place, but nowhere very much. Uh, Abigail, give, a, give us a sense of where the markets are on this second trading day of May. Well, relatively small moves, David, and to your point, we do have gains and losses when we take a look at the major averages. So not a lot of direction off of the lows at the lows. The majors had been down more than 1%, but at this point, it's the S&P 500 and the Dow that are down. The tech heavy Nasdaq is higher. So you can imagine tech is the sector that is doing well. Now, throwing a little bit of fire into the picture, uh, bonds, bonds we have lower. So it's not really risk off. It's more uh, uh, uncertainty, so to speak. The Dow is down down more than the other major averages being weighted on uh, by Boeing because, of course, some of the big news over the weekend, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway out of the airlines. So that's infecting the whole airline complex. And as a result, you have the Dow down a little bit more. Something to point out, the S&P 500 right now headed to its first three-day decline since early March, David. Well, exactly. And I wanted to focus on that because we had the best month uh, uh, since, I think, 87, 33 mm -hmm. years in the month of April. And now we've got a three-day trend. Which way is the market headed? David, that's a great question. That's really a trillion dollar question because something that can be so tricky, we had that huge decline down, a bear market, and then the rebound rally, many thinking that it's a bear market uh, reflex rally. Trend shifts can be very difficult to detect, but what we have is not just these three down days, the worst since March 24th and the bottom for the S&P 500. So in the rally that we've had recently, we are right now in the worst stretch, the longest stretch, uh, but when these turns happen, it's very, very very subtle. Something on top of these three down days is the fact that we are now uh, headed to the third down week in a row. Of course, the week is uh, very young, but last week and the week before, two down weeks. So again, inflection points within uh, what can be a volatile sideways range. That's probably what we're setting up for this year, given all the uncertainty out there. They can be very difficult to uh, detect. Right now, there are some signals that we may be uh, heading back down toward this year's low, David. Okay, thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Well, one of the things that the markets may be paying attention to is some of the talk coming out of the Trump administration about China, both from the president himself as well as his Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. We welcome now Libby Control. She is head of public policy for PIMCO. So Libby, Senate's back in, they're back in town now. One of the things that's going on right now is the president really saber rattling, I think it's fair to say, about the Chinese, even talking about the possibility of tariffs. Is this a realistic possibility? Well, look, Lucia, yeah, thanks, David. Nice to, nice to be with you. Um, I mean, I think we do think it's a possibility. Uh, you know, I think that this is stemming from sort of a few motivations. One is just the sort of China hawks within the administration who are pointing to you know, China's handling of this virus and, and the sort of the lack of information coming from China as sort of the latest proof point that China doesn't necessarily adhere to kind of international norms and, and should be and the folks should be skeptical uh, of them in general. It also um, serves the president in terms of sort of the narrative around, you know, maybe some criticisms around the federal government's handling of, of the virus. And then, of course, we always have to consider the political angle here. Um, and, you know, I think for, for the president, he sees China as a real vulnerability for Vice President Biden going into the election. And he also understands that in terms of the sentiment of voters, you know, more, more voters actually have a negative view of China than they ever have, uh, according to recent polls. So I think he's viewing this as sort of a, a political opportunity as well. So uh, all to say that, yes, this is, you know, this is certainly a possibility. I think what we've learned is that now that we have tariffs on $360 billion of goods coming in from China, we have to take the president seriously when he, uh, you know, is, as you said, saber rattling on, on this issue. So, Libby, as you say, uh, the Republicans believe that there's a vulnerability on the Democrat side, and specifically Vice President Biden about China. Is there any vulnerability coming back the other way? Because the president started out very tough on China, but then we have to remember back in January, we were about to have this major breakthrough in trade relations, and he was praising China for what they'd done. We were getting all this the agricultural product and other bought. Does he have a problem as well pivoting back around to say, oh, no, I was right the first time. China was bad, not good. Yeah, it's a, it's a great it's a great point, David. Because absolutely, is is the president also vulnerable, maybe to some some hypocrisy here? Um, as you mentioned, you know, he, we had entered into this sort of you know phase one of the trade agreement. Um, president Trump was sort of almost lauding China in terms of their handling of the coronavirus back in 
back in January and said that they had been, you know, quite forthcoming. Um, you know, this is not lost, of course, on the Biden campaign, who has put out, you know, a, a, a negative, you know, uh, opposition ad um, two weeks ago on this very point, sort of outlining the president's statements on, sort of positive statements on China. So, so for sure, is the, is the president vulnerable um, to, to sort of the similar attacks? You know, you know, in addition, there's also the kind of economic question of even threatening additional tariffs on China at a time where you have, you know, 20 to 30 million people unemployed. I mean, this is a, there's a big risk here that kind of doubling down on this, on this talk, even if it's just talk, could, could hurt the economy more. So um, for, for sure, is the president vulnerable here, too? But, you know, I think he's, he's probably weighing these and, and thinks the political calculus is more in favor of uh, drawing, you know, a hard line on a hard line China, at least for now. In the, in the meantime, the one thing we know for sure is that Congress has been very busy and appropriating an awful lot of money, and now there's talk yet of a CARES 2, I guess it's called, 2.0 of CARES, as, as I say, the Senate comes back into session. What are the prospects for that, and under what timeline? Yeah, so it's, you know, another, another good question, David. Um, you know, just as a, as a reminder, you know, we've seen Congress act in really an unprecedented fashion and at an unprecedented pace. I mean, as we know, Congress is usually slow to act, um, and they've been anything but. I mean, they have passed four large spending bills aggregating nearly $2.9 trillion, um, the, you know, the biggest amount of, of fiscal stimulus that we've ever seen Congress pass in a largely bipartisan way in the matter of eight weeks. Um, you know, so I think going forward, you know, we expect that there will be additional economic relief, uh, additional stimulus passed by Congress, really a question of, of when, not if, but it will likely be, you know, more partisan than it has been um, over the past eight weeks or so. Again, which has come, you know, those, those bills have come together quite quickly. Uh, we're expecting, you know, this CARES 2.0 to sort of expose more of the traditional partisan fault lines that we've seen over the last decade in Congress. Um, but, you know, with that said, we still expect something to come together over the matter, you know, matter of, of, of weeks, uh, if not sort of in, in the summertime. And Libby, that, that partisan divide, as you describe it, seems to focus in significant part on aid to state and local municipal governments, essentially. As we heard Mitch McConnell, the majority leader at one point, call it a blue state bailout. Are they going to get themselves past that? And can they make a compromise? Because I understand the Republicans want some immunity, as it were, for employers, uh, for bringing people back. Yeah, right. That, that's exactly right. Those are the sort of the two big obstacles, if you will, to kind of to, to sort of the CARES 2.0, um, you know, Speaker Pelosi has put out a trillion dollar figure for aid uh, for states and municipalities. That seems very unlikely. The Governor's Association has supported more of a $500 billion figure. What we've seen Congress do so far is pass funding for $150 billion for states and municipalities. So, you know, I think we would expect the figure, while still being negotiated, to sort of fall between that 150 and that $500 billion level, not necessarily not likely that $1 trillion ask that Speaker Pelosi um, has sort of demanded. And then, as you said, that the Republicans are, you know, laying down their own demands, including this sort of uh, increased, you know, shielding from liability for, uh, for businesses coming back uh, should, you know, an employee or customer get sick. That's also going to be, you know, a partisan issue and, and is likely to face some opposition, especially in, um, in the House, which is controlled by the Democrats. So, you know, long way of saying, again, we expect that something will come together, that these partisan issues, you know, may make this, uh, may, make, may this, uh, take longer, but still probably we'll see something within a matter of weeks, and it will likely be large. I, mean, I think that's another point from a market's perspective is that we're expecting you know, another bill around a trillion dollars, you know, $1.5 trillion, very large sums of money, um, but may pale in comparison to what we've seen so far, but again, you know, extraordinary amount of, yeah. amount of, uh, of economic relief going into the economy. Yeah, exactly. None of us ever thought we'd be talking about these kinds of numbers. Okay, thanks so much to Libby Cantrell. She is PIMCO Head Thank of you. Public Policy. Coming up here, President Trump not only criticized China, he also said he'd like to get those rallies going again. We're going to bring in our Bloomberg political contributor, Rick Davis, to talk about what the president's strategy is here. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television Radio. I'm David Weston. It is time now for Bloomberg First Word News. And for that, with that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. President Trump estimates that as many as 100,000 Americans could die from the coronavirus. He came out with the new projection last night on Fox News. A month ago, the president said he hoped the death toll would be less than 60,000. So far, more than 67,000 Americans have died from the disease. Japan is extending its nationwide state of emergency until the end of May. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe cautioned the country's contagion measures need more times to reduce infection rates. That is, the country recorded more than 15,000 virus cases as of Monday. Prime Minister Abe says he's aiming to have Avagon, an antiviral drug developed by Fujifilm, approved for use as a coronavirus treatment by the end of this month. The Senate secretary says privacy laws prevent the office from releasing any personnel records, including a complaint that Biden's sexual assault accuser Tara Reid claims she filed against him almost three decades ago. Biden, the presumptive Democratic nominee, has denied the allegation. He wrote a letter to the secretary of the Senate on Friday instructing her to release any documentation related to Reid's assertion. The winningest coach in National Football League history has died. Don Shula spent 33 seasons coaching the Baltimore Colts and the Miami Dolphins. He won 347 games, including back-to-back -back Super Bowls with the Dolphins. The 1972 Dolphins are the only NFL team to go through an entire season unbeaten. Coach Don Shula was 90 years old. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Well, President Trump had something of a town hall meeting at the Lincoln Memorial yesterday in which, among other things, he said he really wished he could get back those huge rallies that he seems to revel in. We'll return, bring in now from Stone Court Capital, Rick Davis. He's our Bloomberg political contributor. He has run his own fair share of campaigns, including that of Senator John McCain for President. Rick, great to have you back with us. Thank you for joining us. Give us a sense of what you think is going on within the Trump campaign now. Are they changing their strategy? For a while, it looked like he was really going to take advantage of those evening news briefings about coronavirus. Now he's not doing that so much, and now he seems to be eager to get back to the people, as it were. Yeah, thank you, David, and <clears throat> I hope everybody in the Bloomberg team are uh, safe and healthy. Um, yeah, I think there's been a uh, noticeable change. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Donald Trump had the peak in his polling at the end of February, and since then it's been a, a slow and steady decline, and that has matched uh, the decline in confidence that the American public has with the handling of the coronavirus. And so a lot of the plans that the campaign had going into the coronavirus period, I think, have had a, a full relook. Uh, as you point out, uh, there's not a really good option uh, to campaign from the White House on these, uh, these press conferences that the president has been doing. Uh, the, it seems the more he did them, the, the less the American public liked it, uh, 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 probably a lot in due to his performance during those things. And so he's looking to change and get back to what they know how to do, which is big rallies and sort of the unscripted uh, president talking about mostly his antagonists. So um, that's a very difficult thing to put into place uh, in the middle of a, a, a pandemic, uh, especially uh, in the states that he needs to go to, because these are states that are still grappling with the pandemic. And so maybe they're looking at states. There is a, a beginning to be a sort of a blue state, red state, change in the outlook for COVID, and maybe that will be his opening. Well, talk about that, Rick, exactly, because in order to have those rallies, you have to open up the state. And of course, the president's really advocating doing that as soon as possible. I saw some reporting today that suggested if you look at the blue states and the red states, a lot of the blue states have a lot more cases, but they're growing a lot more slowly than the red states, which have relatively fewer cases, particularly those across the south, but they're growing a lot faster. Is the president basically in a race against November to try to get things open without getting the pandemic come back again? Yeah, I mean, you know, holding the experts' uh, feet to the fire and warnings uh, are already out there about a potential second uh, peak of the virus in the fall and winter. Uh, you're right. The president is looking for openings. And, and, and this is actually quite interesting in that 
there are differences between Republicans and Democrats, and it's not just ideological. It's also where they live. Democrats live in more urban, dense areas, uh, and, and Republicans and Democrats think differently about government. Uh, Democrats think government's a solution to their problems, and Republicans just soon have fewer gov- uh, less government. And, and that plays itself out geographically. As you point out, the South and Southeast, uh, predominantly Republican area, uh, some states in the Midwest uh, would be included in this, have a different view because of those attitudes uh, than um, more urban states on the coast. And so those are the states, the, the more red states, that seem to be moving quickly to, to reopen and, and, and get back to business. And, and I would say on that res- respect, when you do polling and you ask Republicans what's more important to you, fighting COVID or getting the economy started again, more and more of them are saying get the economy started again. When you ask Democrats, they want to fight COVID as a priority. And so, so you really do see uh, the parties playing out in a, in a way of how to handle the COVID and how to handle states going back to business uh, in, a, in a significant way. The, the, so that does create some opportunities in the near future for Trump to maybe get out and, uh, and do a little bit of campaigning. And, of course, we know he's, he's, he's going to be in Arizona this week, and so that's the first opportunity he has in a targeted state to actually try to make an impact with the media there. Rick, go across the aisle and talk about the the Democrat side of this. Uh, We have talked about, you and I have talked about the fact that it looks like the response to this pandemic will be the issue in November. At the same time, another issue came up this last week with this woman from Joe Biden's past, the former vice president, claiming that he had sexually assaulted her 27 years ago. Doesn't seem to be anybody who can figure out exactly what happened there. Is this a real issue or is this a distraction? You know, I think it's I think it's more of a distraction. Um, There are other than, as you say, uh, covid uh, there aren't any other real issues, and so when things like this come up, they get uh, more than their fair share of uh, airtime. And uh, if 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 things like this were going to disqualify candidates for public office, Donald Trump would have never become president of the United States. <laughs> he has over 20 uh, 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 assault yeah. allegations, and and he's blown right through them. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, sure, yep. it's a it's a it's a bump in the road for for uh, Vice President right. Biden's campaign. Takes a little bit of the the, right. the messaging away from him, uh, but it it, it right. highly likely won't play uh, unless there's some fire in the oven. Uh, that won't play a, an important role in the fall campaign. Uh, um, right. Assuredly, by September, this has resolved right. itself one way or another. Right. Okay, another thing that's going to have to resolve itself is who is the vice presidential running mate for uh, Vice President Joe, Joe Biden. We now have a poll out from CBS, at least, saying that it should be Elizabeth Warren. You have some experience in picking vice presidential candidates. What do you think? Well, I'm not going to talk about my experience picking vice presidential candidates, especially <laughs> women. Uh, but, uh, look, I think that this is actually the good news of the vice president uh, uh, Biden's campaign is – the search. You know, we have released last week the names of the people who will pick as uh, be as vetting team. Um, you know, and 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 the press is actively polling and speculating on who within some of the the top runners, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, as you mentioned. You know, Governor Whitmer is a new uh, entrant into this. The governor of Ma- Michigan, who's struggling with the COVID uh, cases there, and uh, and and the other widely talked about uh, governor is Stacey Abrams. This is great stuff. I mean, Biden gets to look like he's making a big decision, which the public want to see how he does that. He can do it on his timetable. There's less pressure on the convention because it's been moved. So uh, this is this is what the Biden campaign wants to talk about all day long. And right, and right. whether it comes out that it's one of these sort of front runners or a uh, dark horse who uh, uh, makes a uh, leap forward soon, um, we don't know. Mm-hmm. But it surely will be someone who will help him uh, with his campaign and election uh, come November. Mm-hmm. And I think that will be the number one decisiveness is uh, who's going to help him mm-hmm. win the most. Right. Rick, thank you so much for joining us. That's Rick Davis. He's, among other things, Bloomberg political contributor, I'm delighted to say. Coming up next here, we're going to have stock of the hour, Tyson's, the food processor, which is struggling with the pandemic. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Stock of the Hour. It is Tyson's. Well, consumers were really stocking up on meat and putting it in their freezer in anticipation of the pandemic, but Tyson's had to spend an awful lot of money to keep those plants open and to keep their workers safe. Here for more is Abigail Doolittle. Well, it has certainly been a very difficult situation this year for these uh, protein companies. Lots of headlines in the news recently about shortages around food, mainly because these plants, these slaughterhouses, uh, there have been widespread cases of COVID-19. So the uh, companies have really struggled as to whether or not to keep the, the plants open or, or to close them to protect their workers, perhaps the food supply as well, but more so their workers. As a result, you have uh, less volume going out and you have higher input costs because they are compensating at this point some of their workers to a greater degree. That means gross margins going in the wrong direction, David. They are going down. They said that the second quarter is going to be worse than expected and they pulled the full year outlook because of all of this. They're just not sure how quickly they'll be able to get some of these plants back online, uh, David. Uh, Abigail, is this representative, do we know, of the meat and the uh, food processing business more generally, or is it more specific to Tyson? No, it certainly is. It's a widespread trend uh, for some of these other companies, too. Some of the more poultry-related companies, such as Sanderson, uh, an egg company, uh, along with Pilgrim's Pride. Uh, so lots of difficulties here as these companies struggle, again, to keep their workers uh, safe. Relative to Tyson, uh, the bulk of their business is beef, and then it's poultry, and they're now talking about the possibility of near term outages um, in food retail. But the bigger point here, David, is actually goes to restaurants. That's about 40% of their revenue. Uh, and relative to the meat industry overall for those workers, it's brutal under the best conditions. These workers are very uh, close together as these animals go through. Perhaps one lesson to come out of the crisis, David, could be the idea uh, that a $1 hamburger in the present day is just not feasible. It'd be interesting to see that as uh, this situation goes on, David. Yeah. Indeed. Thank you so very much to Abigail Doolittle for that stock of the hour. Coming up here on Balance of Power, we're going to get to hear from the CEO of Raymond James Financial about his thoughts on credit and what is going on with the banking industry. That's going up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Welcome to Bloomberg Balance of Power. I'm Shanali Basic. Joining me now is Paul Riley, the CEO of Raymond James from St. Petersburg, Florida. At Raymond James, they actually saw record increases when it came to cash balances. And that draws me to wonder, Paul, when why are your clients all behaving a lot like Warren Buffett here? And why is it that they are hoarding cash? Do they not see opportunities to put this money to work? Well, personally, great to be uh, with you, even though uh, remotely. Uh, I think a lot of the clients, uh, most of them have held in equities. I think a lot of people that went to cash went from fixed income, kind of near cash instruments and converted it into pure cash, both for liquidity um, and also because uh, of uh, in government insurance, really, in these cash accounts that they can get that they can't get in uh, money market types of funds. Well, speaking of government insurance here, is something interesting about your client's base is that this is private clients. This tends to lean a little wealthier. If they're not putting money to work in this economy, how are we supposed to get the economy to kickstart? Yeah, I think there's an awful lot of wait and see. And as, you know, this uh, the whole virus and what return to work is going to look like leaves a lot of uncertainty. So, you know, people fall into two camps. That is, this, as we gradually open up now, if the consumer comes back and the opening up goes without flaws and people get back to work and start earning money and spending money, the economy will start recovering. If that doesn't happen, um, many of the many businesses won't make it that are on the edge. Or if it goes into a second wave and there's another close down, it'll be devastating for businesses. And so many people are keeping liquid, waiting for that event uh, to buy or to invest through the second cycle, or to get comfortable enough that the cycle is going to continue to be positive and they can invest. So. And you can see that in the markets 
as they go. Two weeks ago is a bad week. Next, last week's a good week. You know, April is a good month. We open up, you know, tough today. So people are just very, very uncertain as what this recovery is going to look like. Well, given this uncertainty, you mentioned the term government insurance when it came to cash balances, to, to deposits. People can feel comfortable with the money they put away in the safe. But what would it take for them to start investing again? Again, I think it's we're, I think people are waiting for a recovery sign that we are in a recovery, that there's so many businesses affected by COVID from big businesses to little businesses. And the question is, even with a lot of the government programs, which have been great at keeping businesses open, most of those programs were two-month programs or three-month pro programs really to keep people paid or to keep businesses open through the cycle. As people getting back to work, the question is, will the consumer show up? Will they show up at restaurants? Will they get on a plane? You know, will they go to events? And if the answer is yes, a lot of those businesses will make it, and over time will be able to start paying their debt. Uh, if the answer is no, then a lot of those businesses won't make it. So people are very uncertain in what to invest in. And the airline industry is a great example where, you know, even if it was to, if people were totally under, un, uh, went off a lockdown and everywhere and they were free to move around, Right. Are they going to get on a plane? Are they going to get on a cruise ship? Are they going to, you know, the consumer spending is what's going to drive the economy forward. And that's a big unknown. How will, how will consumers right. behave over these next three months? Paul, uh, we spoke this morning to Jim Milstein, the co-CEO, uh, co-chairman of Guggenheim Securities. One of the things he mentioned was with these government programs, with these ballooning debt levels, that what will happen is that the corporate sector and wealthier individuals, people who have been able to benefit uh, regardless of this time frame, are the ones that are going to be have to be, uh, to be taxed more to pay for a lot of these efforts. I'm very curious as to your reaction to that thinking. Is that threat something your clients are are considering? Well, um, I'm not running for president, so I don't have to uh, <laughs> take any political positions. My view is, honestly, this has been a subject not just because of this. Uh, it's before this, we've had growing debt, and at some point, how do you pay it back? And you either do it through growing the economy faster than we have been able to in recent times, or you're going to have to increase taxes. You know levels and it's been a big political debate is how do you do that um some have tried to tax you know the one percent but truthfully there's not enough money there um you know to tax the one percent if 50 percent of people in the u.s pay no taxes and their children are elderly or you know not employed and it's kind of hard to throw it on one small group so Given these economic levels, if you really started repaying debt, taxes would have to go up really across the board. And the question is, what does that do to continue growth? And that's, you know, kind of the wide open question. And part of that's political and part of it's economic reality. We need more revenue if we're going to pay back this debt. So the idea of greater taxes to the 1%, how much of a threat is that and how are people preparing for that? Um, I don't think most people are overly preparing for that. I think that most people would expect some reasonable increase uh, in taxes to the wealthy. We've seen all sorts of programs. I think what they uh, balk at are some of the more extreme, you know, wealth taxes that are bigger numbers or, you know, versus taxes on income. But I think most people assume taxes will go up. And, I, you know, I, for an individual, think that's okay. Other people may not. But you know, I, I, I think that taxes where they were even before the last cut on the wealthy were fine. So um, uh, I, political reality is taxes are going to go up. The wealthy are going to have to bear more than those that aren't wealthy. It's how do you do it, how quickly, and, you know, what's the fair allocation of, of how, you, how you pay those taxes. So I think taxes are going up, and most people, uh, I think, are operate under that assumption right now. Paul, thank you for joining us from St. Petersburg, Florida. From New York, for Bloomberg Radio and Television, this is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Bloomberg First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte is facing a revolt from business and political rivals. Starting today, the nationwide lockdown is being eased in Italy. Pressure to speed up the reopening is likely to increase. New deaths and infections blamed on the virus have fallen to the lowest level in almost two months. President Jair Bolsonaro already fanned political tensions in Brazil by cheering on a protest against the country's top court and Congress. President Bolsonaro said Brazilians want a government that can work for the country's future without interference. That as the nation's coronavirus death toll surpasses 7,000. To contain the spread, several regions will extend quarantine and restrictions. President Trump is pressing to reopen the United States for business, but he runs the risk of promising too much. Last night on Fox News, the president complained that some states aren't moving fast enough to ease public health restrictions. He promised that the United States would have a vaccine by the end of the year and that the economic, the economy rather, would fully rebound in the fourth quarter. Roche is the latest company to get emergency U.S. approval for a coronavirus antibody test. The Swiss drug maker promises that production will scale up quickly. The test is designed to identify people already exposed to the virus. In a break from tradition due to the pandemic, the U.S. Supreme Court today, for the first time, heard arguments in a case by teleconference. The nine justices began a scheduled hour of arguments in a trademark dispute involving hotel reservation website Booking.com. The justices over the next two weeks are set to conduct arguments in 10 cases remotely. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Mark. Well, Senate is back in business in Washington today as talk is turning already to maybe yet another round, so-called maybe CARES 2.0, of infusion into the economy that needs it rather badly. We welcome now the Democratic senator from Minnesota, Tina Smith. So, Senator, thank you so much for joining us on your first day back here. Uh, give us your sense, from your perspective, what is the right answer about a possible new bill to appropriate money? Right answer for the country and for Minnesota. Well, both Minnesota and, this con and our country are uh, grappling with a massive public health and economic emergency. You know, I've been, uh, even though I'm back in Washington today, I have been hard at work in Minnesota every single day helping Minnesota respond to this crisis. And so now that we are back here, I think our most important job is to continue that work. I am uh, very, feel very strongly that we need to do the oversight that is our responsibility in Congress. And we can do that through our committee process, and I expect that we'll be doing that remotely. That is certainly my intention. And as we think about um, how we move forward with um, additional legislation, you know, certainly at the top of my list are the, is, is the needs that we have around testing and ample supplies of testing supplies so that um, Americans can get the tests that we need so that we can safely reopen our economy and get people um, back into uh, the, those who have been working from home or uh, even worse have been furloughed can get back to their jobs. And I also think it's important to remember that um, state and local governments that provide um, police and fire and transportation and the most basic of fundamental uh, services in this country are going to need help continuing to provide those services and help in avoiding the, the potentially massive layoffs that would happen if the federal government doesn't step in to, um, to be a good partner. So, Senator, let's take each of those in turn. First, with the testing. I know in the last bill that was passed, I think it was $25 billion for testing, another $75 billion for hospitals. Is that the sort of approach, or is appropriations for state and local in part appropriations for testing itself? Well, I think that there's really a two related but separate things. When it comes to testing, we are in Minnesota, for example, we are working to get to 20,000 tests a day, which would be one of the highest, my governor tells me, per capita uh, testing rates of any place in the country. But we're, having, we're struggling to get there because we can't get the swabs and the other uh, testing supplies that are needed. So what many of us in Congress on the Democratic side want to do is to move legislation forward that would require the president to 
put into place and fully the Defense Production Act so that the full force of the federal government could be brought to bear on a coordinated response to making sure that states everywhere, including in rural areas, have access to the testing that they're going to need. That, to me, is a, what we need there as a strong federal response. The other issue is that states have the resources, state and cities and local communities, counties, for example, have the resources to continue to do the provide the basic services that Americans and Minnesotans count on. And that is um, going to be uh, falling apart, literally, in, um, in just a you know, very short period of time if the federal government doesn't step up. Well, and, and Senator, it seems like a, a wide range of people agree that there has to be some help for the states. Already has been some, but needs to be more. President Trump has said uh, on mm -hmm. various occasions he thinks that's appropriate. At the same time, it's become very politically charged in Washington, with, with Mitch McConnell, the majority leader, saying it's a bailout for the blue states, something like that. Uh, if the Republicans do say, we want to appropriate money for the states and the municipalities, but we do want some provision to protect employers against uh, lawsuits if they comply with CDC regulations, why isn't that a reasonable compromise? Well, first, I really reject the idea that this is some sort of a blue state bailout. First of all, Republican states and Democratic states, red states and blue states are all facing the same kind of budget crisis. And, you know, in my state of Minnesota, I was uh, before I was in the Senate, I was lieutenant governor and I helped to run the state of Minnesota. And we had a strong budget uh, surplus and uh, a budget reserve. And in fact, Minnesota taxpayers send much more money to the federal government than we get in return. So that's not a bailout by any means. Now, the thing that Mitch McConnell is talking about is um, just strikes me as sort of the, you know, the height of, of politicizing an issue that shouldn't be politicized. Police departments and fire departments uh, shouldn't be politicized. But he's saying essentially in return for helping to support those basic so uh, services that all Americans rely on, he wants to let big companies, big corporations off the hook when it comes to keeping their workers safe. And to me, that's a, not a reasonable uh, bargain at all. You know, if I'm a if, I, if my employer is um, requiring that in order to keep my job, I need to I work in an environment that isn't safe where there aren't appropriate safeguards for my health and the health of my family. Uh, I, I don't I don't think that's right. I think that's why we have consumer protection in this country and we shouldn't be sacrificing it now when people are so concerned about their health. And as a matter of fact, you know, the way the reason that people will go back to work and will go back out to that restaurant or the local um, retail store is because they feel that it's safe. So to me, it's counterproductive to roll back safety and consumer standards or to not roll back the protections. Um, you know, right now. Well, exactly. But, and Senator, uh, this is not to argue, but just to literally understand. I understand we clearly have to have incentives for employers to do everything they can to keep their workers safe. Absolutely. No question about that. But as I understand, the proposal is sort of a safe harbor. If you comply with the CDC guidance, then you cannot be sued. Does that make some sense in an extraordinary circumstance? I mean, if I'm an employer and I do everything the CDC tells me to do, and yet something happens that none of us could have anticipated, should I be sued for that? Well, I think that the, the you know, my basic view is that we should allow the the courts and the way that we the way we guarantee justice in this country. I don't understand why we would need to roll that back at this time in our history. I don't think that it's necessary, and uh, I think that it is um, what, what I really think that this is, is a kind of an opportunity to put forth the uh, kind of, uh, you know, a reform on uh, liability that, uh, you call it reform, but the, the efforts at, at, you know, rolling back liability protections that have um, been the uh, kind of the sacred cow of, of folks for many, many years. And let's not do that right now. Let's focus on what we can do to safely reopen our economy and make sure that we can be funding uh, social, ser uh, social services and police and fire. Let's do that right now and not try to get this other thing done. Senator, I really appreciate you spending time with us today. As I say, in your first ba day back from Minnesota, that's Senator Tina Smith, Democrat of Minnesota. Coming up here next, President Trump wants new stimulus given to people by way of a payroll tax reduction. We're going to talk with David, David uh, McIntosh. He is the president of Club for Growth. That's going up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, President Trump yesterday said he has an idea about what should be done in if there is a CARES 2.0, what we should do is make sure we reduce payroll tax deductions. We well, welcome now uh, David McIntosh. He is the president of Club for Growth to get his sense of what we should be doing for the economy. So, David, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're well down there in Washington. Give us a sense. Do you think a payroll tax deduction is the way to go right now? be with you and we're doing well I, I think the payroll tax uh, you know a temporary waiver of it could boost um, the rehiring of people uh, but in, in the end it also causes further complications on the fiscal side one of the things that I think is even better is for Congress to grant the president the authority to waive regulations so that small businesses can come up uh, not have to worry about all the red tape but immediately rehire people it costs them about 15,000 per employee right now to comply with all of the federal regulations. If we can waive some of that, that's an even bigger incentive, I think, than the temporary payroll cut, tax cut. What, what kind of regulations do you have in mind, waiving for small business? Because I must say, one of the things that occurs to me is OSHA. Uh, we tend to think of OSHA as protecting our employees. Don't we need something like that right now? You would keep the ones you need for health and safety, but OSHA, for example, uh, costs a huge amount to just keep up with the paperwork. So if you gave small businesses basically uh, the uh, – we want, aren't going to enforce all of the paperwork requirements if you make a good fo faith effort to comply with the rules and keep it up to date. Uh, that's one example. There's all sorts of requirements on truckers, for example, that you can loosen up so they can have more flexible hours and be able to keep up with all the deliveries. A lot of state regulations limit who can sell what to when. If we can uh, get rid of those so that people can have a lot more flexibility in rebuilding their businesses uh, with a new customer base, right? People are still going to be cautious about going out, and you need to make it easier to deliver, for example, deliver your sangria with your Mexican meal. So, so, David, uh, can we keep this pace up of appropriating money as a practical matter? I mean, I think that so far it's been something like 14 percent of GDP. We can't keep spending money that fast, can we? How do we come down off of that? What period of time do we need to come down off of that? And let's be clear, don't we have to raise taxes at some point on somebody someplace? Well, let, let me talk about the spending, David, because I think you're exactly right. Um, I view the spending that they've done as a bridge, and frankly, it, it was in a panic, so they probably made it too too rich uh, of a spending. So they've got to now look and see as we reopen the economy. That's going to be the best thing to do in terms of, of actually getting people back to work and things starting to come back to normal rather than throw more money. That was sort of a temporary way of keeping people so they could continue to live dur during the shutdown. Raising taxes right now would be devastating on that effort to – restart the economy. You're going to see anywhere from, I saw a prediction of a 40 percent cut in GDP in the second quarter. If you then add taxes on top of that, it's going to be even worse in the third and fourth quarter. So I, I think the key thing for us to do is remove the burdens the government puts on people that aren't necessary, simplify regulations, cut the red tape, and start reopening the businesses as soon as you can in using the guidance of the healthcare officials. So David, you had the club for growth and, and in a normal circumstance, we were talking about what can we do to grow the economy? Right now we have to stop the hemorrhaging and get it start to come back to where it was before we can really talk about growth. But are there things coming out of this pandemic that you think might fundamentally change the economy in a good way that would allow us to have true growth going forward? There are some things coming out of it. One, we're seeing a lot more people working from home that's going to be an efficient way for it, people to do and get their job done. We'll see more people adopt to that and, and adapt it. Um, and then second, we're seeing changes in our supply chain, right, necessitated by the fact that China was completely shut down. Now we're worried and suspicious that they weren't completely candid with the rest of the world about this. And one way to rebuild the supply chain in the U.S. is, again, you know, reduce the cost of doing business in the U.S., so that we can see that business return and all up and down that supply chain have a much more efficient model that will, will be different than it was before the coronavirus. Okay, David, really appreciate you coming on. Always do. That's David McIntosh. He is the president of Club for Growth with some ideas about how to get the economy going again that don't necessarily 
involve appropriating a lot of money. That's going to do it for the first hour of Balance of Power, but there is a second hour. It's over on radio. And over on radio, we're going to be talking with Lieutenant Governor of Michigan, one of the hard-hit statements by the uh, states by the coronavirus. He is Garland Gilchrist. So we'll be talking with Garland Gilchrist and others on the second hour of Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.